Look, I know the substance of my last rumor video was questionable at best, but to dissuade the rumors, no, I am not a furry, for the same reason that I do not play Genshin or I'm a billionaire, and it's because I'm not into children. But to prove this fact, I'll be attempting to survive 100 days in RimWorld whilst being constantly attacked by a deluge of furries. Will we succeed in turning this colony into a degenerate graveyard? Or will they take my colonists and do unspeakable things to them? Uh, oh, oh dear. So, let us begin. To survive such a gruesome challenge, we need a man strong in will and mind. As such, I have decided upon the subscriber, Kristaps Crummins. I see your messages, Kristaps, and know that I truly feel blessed whenever you grace my comment sections. You truly are a gem. And as such, I have given you the glory of slaughtering many, many furries on my behalf. If you would like to be subject to such torture, then be sure to like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment telling me what you want done to you. Be sure to keep it PG-13 as I would like my comment section not to look like a teenage girl's Wattpad story. With that, we land on the planet and the challenge begins. The moment we landed, it was time to get to work. For this run, we chose the nearest, safest place to live, and that's of course, in the side of a mountain. Daring today, aren't we? And once we had the essentials set up, I would say that it looked pretty good. Now for this game, we were playing with the Eagle Invader Storyteller, which has a funny little gimmick, that being sending people to come and kick your ass every other day of the week. But in this case, it's not people, but instead furry degenerates coming to collect my hard-earned taxes. But just like the IRS, when they come knocking, they'll be greeted by some funny contraptions, sending them back to hell where they belong. But before they're greeted by the big guns, we must first introduce to them the little guns. Baby steps. While I only figured this out after the challenge had started, it seems that Igor is a bit of a stickler for the rules, and will only throw raids at you after you have two or more colonists. So I waited, and waited, and waited until 11 days went past, when finally we got an event that gave us another colonist. Welcome, Harry, or should I say, Meat Shield. We were also able to name a few things, for which I aptly named our faction, Damnation, and our colony, Pain. Oh, if only I knew. But with our new slave, I mean, valued member of the colony, we were able to complete a fridge to store our food, and also give our colonists their own rooms revolutionary. But before any of that, along comes our first raid. It was two weeks in on day 14 when our first raid took place. A singular furry with a knife, and he charged headfirst into our defense. He died. With our overwhelming victory over our opponent, the first of many mass graves were dug as a monument to our conquest. But from this point, Igor was not going to give us any breaks, as not even two days had passed until we had yet another raid. However, as it was the same size as the last, it ended about as well as you'd expect. Continuing on, however, we saved a woman named Ray Wolfen, who just happened to land in our area, and after they had fully recovered, they decided to just get up and leave. But we had other plans. We also had a drifter joint named Warner, who seemed like a very valuable and reliable member of the colony. Just for him to add a drop of a hat, betray us immediately after a raid. Needless to say, we were not too happy about this, especially considering that he tore out Meat Shield's kidney. Hey, I was gonna do that. Moving into day 25, we were in the thick of winter, and while getting low on food, we never got to the point of cannibalism. However, we did start taking certain parts of the body from our adversaries. But soon after, we were able to convince Ray Wolfen to join the colony, which while helping us, also put a further strain on our available resources. However, just like clockwork, Igor sends us a horde of manhunting hares, so we can continue on till the end of winter, just so that he can kick our ass a little while longer. Longer. Thanks, Igor. On day 30, we complete an ominous stone structure that grants us yet another colonist named Sigma. And like her namesake, this colonist is pretty based. And now, with this squad of iron willed gamers, we must delve into the sciences to equip them with the best weapons and armor for the trials ahead. But do you know what isn't a trial? Liking and subscribing to the channel. You don't want to be a furry now, do you? That's gross. And not only because they're furries, but because they're rich. Have you seen how much one of those suits cost? So join me, comrades, as we fight against the bourgeois and continue the real fight.
With the addition of the Vanilla Expanded's Pirates mod, our colonists have access to war caskets, suits that make our pawns almost completely useless apart from a few select skills, in exchange for being chunky boys with a hell of a lot of defense. But unfortunately, we put this procedure on the back burner as not only do I not have the resources to make the suit, but I don't want Kristaps to become a potato just yet. And the reason I say unfortunately is because Igor begins to pick up the raids to the point that they're actually becoming difficult? No. Rimworld? Difficult? No. But hey, more organs for my consumption. And so this new paradigm sets in, where day after day, we get raided consistently while trying to make the little progress we can. Until finally, we say enough and start expanding the war casket room to make space for a very familiar table. Day 55 was a rather momentous day for the colony, as not only did Kristaps and Raywolf get married, Good job, Chris Stapps. But the colony's R&D sector was expanding in leaps and bounds, with the building of a few key pieces of technology, that being the high-tech research bench, trade console, and most importantly, the Rim Atomics research bench. Nah, you know what it is. Falling on this crutch save after save never gets old. But this time, it'll be paid off by my organ profits. Some say you can't put a price on a life, but I can. $1,243,756, minus tax. But speaking of the price on human life, one could say Kristaps' one has gone up in droves with the advent of these new machines. We now have the resources to spare to get Kristaps dripped out in his new war casket. Ignore the fact that this turns him into a vegetable because he does become a vegetable. A very competent killing vegetable. But back to the table, we were able to use our morally grey currency to research a variety of weapons that will make our life on this hellhole much easier. But while our funds are still low and we can't research the fun weapons just yet, we can instead settle on Clash of Clans copyright infringement and turn all the raiders who come to face us into a lovely KFC snack meal for four. On day 65, another winter had already set in, as well as many more raids, taxing the already shoddy mental state of the colonists. But to alleviate the stress for everyone, Chris Apps, in defending the colony, accidentally shot his wife's jaw clean off. Well, that's one way to shut her up. But while all appeared to be going well on the surface, it was not all as it seemed, as every day between the hours of 1 and 5 in the morning, power to the base went off, which was not very good, as all of our power-based turrets needed power. So I decided to get my colonists to slave away, creating yet another room in the mountain to prepare for full-scale oil production. Around this time, we also get the final member of the colony, Zelf, leaving this as the final squad tasked with surviving the next 35 days. With these five members, we were able to get oil set up very quickly, and while doing so, Igor sends us a shipment of face masks. Uh, I think you're about three years too late, man. Three quarters in on day 75, and it's starting strong with Zelf breaking down, having a tantrum, and destroying a liver. I guess you could say that he couldn't stomach his stress, ha. <laughs> Wait. We also receive toxic fallout over our territory, which makes all of our colonists exactly like me, allergic to going outside. However, this strange weather event does give me the idea to develop a new weapon. During this week, we start on some rather large projects. First of all is the replacement of all wooden walls in our base with limestone, so that whenever Igor wakes up in a bad mood, he can't just cause an electrical failure to light up our entire base like a damn Christmas tree. Secondly is the creation of a marauder auto cannon, which you might remember from a previous video. Is it overkill? Absolutely. But is it fun? Of course. And finally, we equip Kristaps, our golden boy, with a brand new set of state-of-the-art power armor for his war casket. Also, he can be an even better meat shield. Along the lines, we also do a few more funny acts, like cooking some of the natives alive. Now, while I'd like to say this is the last war crime I commit, oh, what am I saying? Of course I don't. Day 90 arrived with just the usual at this point, but a strange feeling was in the air. Something wasn't quite right, like something big was going to happen, and soon. So feeling the need to prepare, I went overkill and started constructing a great wall around the base, and then placed a few Tesla coils. And then also remember that Marauder Cannon? Yeah, I made two more of them, and good thing I did, because uh oh, the day was here, with a suitable size raid to boot, but not to worry, because unlike my predecessor, we had that secret weapon from earlier. What secret weapon, you ask? Chemical warfare.
Very quickly, the combatants had their lungs filled with the toxic gases, but the colonists did not relent. Kristaps stood ready with his sword, prepared to kill the degenerates storming the gates. Soon after, they oddly couldn't stand the smell of piss anymore, so they began to approach the base, only to get a rather unexpected surprise. However, even with the Marauder cannons ripping and tearing, the enemies were still able to open a hole that they used for entry. This is where Chris Stapps and the others took the fight to the furries, sending the entire wave scurrying like rats. During this defense, mortar fire had been relentless, with some getting inside the base and causing just a little bit of damage. But that was for naught, as the defense was of the utmost importance, and so the other colonists took the back lines while Chris Stapps was distracting any incoming enemies. Until... Ray Wolfen, the ex-wife of Kristaps, had died. Wait a minute. Not only was she incredibly unlucky to lose her jaw from a stray bullet of her husband, but now she's lost her entire head from a stray shot from a furry. Ray Wolfen really taken all the L's in this episode. But soon the force was finally pushed back, and after hearing about a colonist's death, the attacking force sent some troops to apply pressure. They didn't get very far. And in the crumbling remains of their settlement, a funeral was held for Ray Wolfen. The colony was alive, severely wounded, but alive, ready to continue another story. However, this is where this story ends. Kristaps Crummins, the furry slayer, and his crew have made a name for themselves this day. And while not without consequence, they know that this event alone has secured their safety on this desolate and hellish planet.